William Haston is a congressional candidate for Georgia's fourth district. William, welcome to the show. Hey, John, thanks for having me. Uh, glad to have you here and uh, excited to uh, catch up on uh, with you on the state of the race. Um, it's been like three weeks since I talked to, with you, I think. Um, so yeah, just a little over that. Yeah, so we're moving closer to uh, the elections. But for people who might not have seen our initial conversation, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in this race. Uh, so I decided to jump into this race uh, to mainly fight for the economic dignity and prosperity of everyday people. Um, we see over and over again that our system has kind of been bought out. Uh, and our incumbent uh, that is currently sitting in the seat in the congressional district, in the Georgia's fourth congressional district uh, is one of those corporate dims in my mind. And so um, kind of seeing it and seeing what's going on in our district decided to jump right in and, um, and you know, throw my hat in the ring and, and try to win this thing. So you, you said it's uh, it's made the grounded and concern for economic dignity. Tell us a little bit about the state of the district. How have things been under the current incumbent? Uh, so our district is um, you. I guess you would consider it kind of a middle class district. Uh, it's it's uh, one of those huge southern gerrymandered districts. Uh, we've got quite a bit of urban population, some suburban, and then a little bit of rural uh, kind of mixed together. So our our uh, our poverty rates are a little bit higher uh, than the national average. Our unemployment rate is about three and a half percent higher um, than that of uh, the national average in the state of Georgia. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so, um, our district is kind of in need of some things. You know, we're yeah. in need of a little bit of a boost. Well, you know, um, I, I do want to return to the current incumbent and talk to you a little bit about him in a bit. But um, when we're talking about the state of your district, I saw in my research that Georgia has the fourth highest uninsured rate. And throughout this primary, we've heard a lot of talk about, you know, whether in terms of healthcare, if the ACA should be strengthened, or should Medicare for all be instituted? It would, I would imagine that in Georgia, the stakes are are even higher than usual because of the high uninsured rate. So, if you were to replace the incumbent, what would you be advocating for in terms of healthcare? Absolutely. So, I am a huge proponent of Medicare for all. It's one of my top issues that I'm running on. Um, and the, and the reason that we're so highly uninsured is because Georgia has yet to accept the Medicaid expansion offered by the ACA. Uh, I think Medicare for all takes that out and provides people health care. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, we're looking at just giant insurance markets um, versus actually insuring people um, and giving them the ability to go to the doctor. You know, we always hear here in Georgia in the campaign ads, you know, everybody is going to have access to health care. But access is, is one thing. Actually being able to go and see a doctor when you need it is an entirely different thing. Uh, and that's why I believe we need Medicare for all. We can't wait. We need it now, uh, especially here in Georgia, where, like I said, without that Medicaid expansion, there are tons and tons of people who are uninsured or underinsured. Uh, and they're being crushed under the weight of premiums that are continuing to rise. You know, I know that there have been a lot of state level efforts to try to push for either Medicaid or Medicare expansion, uh, oftentimes because Republican governors or Republican state legislatures have been opposed to it. Have has there been that sort of activism in Georgia that, that perhaps you could build on in your candidacy? Absolutely. So there are tons of, of progressive candidates at the state level running uh, to do just that. Uh, they want that Medicaid expansion, they want to, you know, open up. The, the marketplace to tons and tons of people who right now just don't have the option. Uh, and you know, at, it, with it being flu season right now, and we're seeing our hospitals here in Georgia fill up, um, there are so many people that are in need of care, uh, but they're unable to get it just, just for the simple fact that it is political stubbornness. You know, it, it, it takes political courage to stand up to you know, your fellow Republicans and say, our people need this. Uh, and right now we don't have that. And so our progressives, especially here in the metropolitan Atlanta area, are really fighting to try to get that for more and more people. Yeah. So let's talk now about uh, Hank Johnson, the current Democratic incumbent. Um, you know, primary races are always uh, tricky uh, because yep. you have to differentiate yourself, not, not against someone who necessarily disagrees with you on everything, but someone who you might have some overlap. So um, what are some of the biggest policy differences that, that you would offer as Congressman for the, the fourth district versus the current incumbent, Hank Johnson? Absolutely. So my campaign is kind of built on the five pillars of the Progressive Economic Pledge, uh, ending corruption, the Green New Deal, uh, higher wages, college for all, and Medicare for all. Uh, those are all things that I think differentiate me from Congressman Johnson uh, just on their face. You know, whenever, whenever I come out and say, I think we should tie the minimum wage to inflation, that would raise it to almost $22 an hour. Uh, that is a radical idea to those who have been in Washington 
uh, for, you know, six, seven terms now. Uh, and, and to say that that would actually raise up people uh, beyond what, you know, some of the more popular things are right now. I think UBI being one, uh, you know, raising that minimum wage, it, it changes, you know, people's lives drastically all at once. So, you know, it would triple folks income mm -hmm. uh, who are working on minimum wage. And then to say, you know, when, when we talk about ending corruption, it's not just, you know, get the money out of politics. Obviously that is the biggest part of it. Uh, but the other part is to close that revolving door. You know, you having government officials go into industry and come back in and ostensibly, you know, use their position to further the industry they were just in is wrong. And so, you know, differentiating ourselves and saying that that is the fight, you know, without ending corruption, none of the other stuff is possible. And so, you know, hitting the ground running and saying no more uh, is, is the biggest differentiator. So let's stay on the corruption for just a minute because I believe in my research it showed that you uh, you support not just you know more campaign finance reforms but actually a constitutional amendment to get money out of elections. Is that correct? Absolutely, one hundred percent. You know, having that ability to not only say that you know the courts have decided this, but that it constitutionally no more we will publicly finance elections uh, would change everything. You know, for a candidate like me. Um, who is raising money from through the grassroots um, and having to, you know, send out the emails, do the social media posts, do the constant calling and and trying to raise up that groundswell, you know, public financing elections and not allowing corporate interests to buy off politicians um, is a total game changer for having actual representation for everyday people. Yeah, so let's talk now about the race. Uh, it's been a little bit longer since we last spoke. Um, in terms of like communication from the DNC, the the, the D Triple C, um, that sort of thing. Uh, in terms of Hank Johnson, are are we seeing um, like is there is there concern about your candidacy? Is there the possibility of debates? Um, what what is the the future of this race going to look like? At this point, uh, as far as the DNC and the DCCC go, I have yet to hear anything as far as you know debates or possibilities of you know that that imminent you know doom that that seems that uh, incumbents are facing here recently. Um, but I can imagine that as we you know as we get further into the spring, uh, kind of running up to the presidential primary and then into our primary, uh, that things will start to heat up here in Georgia, uh, especially with you know all of the races. Uh, that are right around our district are are heavily contested, mm -hmm. uh, including ours. And so I can imagine that as we get closer, there will be a lot more opportunities for uh, Congressman Johnson and I to engage uh, one on one in debate. Well, I imagine that you're probably pretty supportive of it. Has he given any indication if he would be willing? Do you know if in past primary challenges has he been? Will, will he engage in debates? Oh, absolutely. I think he will engage in debates. Uh, I don't think that there will be. Uh, too much reluctance to that. I think it's just a matter of, um, for lack of a better way of putting it, for uh, us to jump onto his radar. I think that that's going to be the biggest thing. Um, you know, you get kind of comfortable after seven terms, and, and you know, it takes um, someone really making a substantial push uh, and getting people talking to you about that person before you're willing to kind of engage. Yeah. And so I can imagine. Uh, that that that's kind of how this one's going to go. And so overall, what what has the experience been like? You're now you're like a month more into the race in terms of uh, being able to generate um, um, uh, donations, especially with you. You have a very progressive campaign finance strategy, uh, getting volunteers and those sorts of things. How is the race proceeding? Uh, it's actually going it's going fairly well. Uh, we're still kind of slogging through the fundraising as as all you know uh, first time upstart candidates do. Um, but it, it, it's you know it's moving along. Volunteers are starting to you know sign up, and, and they're raring at the bit to kind of get into the fight in 2020. And so we're looking to take that excitement and really run headlong uh, into knocking doors, making those phone calls, and really getting getting our name out there, um, and preparing for you know getting further and further into the you know, the primary season. Uh, definitely uh, getting the boat out. Now, um, I want to ask you about something that probably doesn't come up a lot in just your you know, talking with potential constituents. But a number of congressional candidates have been uh, pretty quiet on the topic of impeachment, which has dominated you know national news over the past couple of months. Um, you have not been; you've been pretty outspoken yeah. about it. Um, what, what led to that decision to 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 weigh in on something that there are a number of people that think that it might be very divisive? I mean, you're not like in you know a particularly swing district or anything like that. But talk to me about making that decision to be outspoken on this issue. Yeah, honestly, it was. It's from our constituents, you know, uh, from attending tons of town halls over the summer and hearing constituents constantly ask, "When are we going to impeach?" Uh, the folks here in this district have been asking that question since early June, 
Um, they see the things going on. They know that it's not right. Um, and in, in, in all reality and in all honesty, um, being in a majority, a minority district, uh, knowing full well that the people within this district could not get away with the same things, it leads to the question of what are we going to do about it? Yeah. When do we fight back and how do we put our foot down and say everybody in this country will have the law apply to them? Yeah, see, when you say it like that, it's just so simple because <laughs> I've been very frustrated for the past couple of months that like, you know, if it's you know, people in the media, uh, politicians, even Democratic leadership, they talk about it almost exclusively from the point of view of how will this affect my reelection chances? How will this affect you know November 2020? Um, but when you communicate like that about what it's really about at the end of the day, I have to imagine that must connect with people a lot more effectively. Absolutely, I mean, in just saying that, you know, you're walking around in a world where you, the President of the United States, believes that he can get away with anything. There's not, he feels like, and he's been enabled and emboldened by those around him to think that he can just get away with committing crimes. He can get away with withholding aid. He can get away with, you know, bribery and extortion um, and having the American people behind those who had the political will and courage to say, we're going to stand up and we're going to push back, not to be timid about it, but to boldly say, you're not above the law. You know, I saw a ton of tweets and, and there were all the interviews of saying this is a sad day. And the thing that I kept saying over and over again was it's not a sad day when you're standing up for democracy. It's not a sad day when you're doing what's right and fighting back. And that's exactly what it is. It's not sad. It's that the hand was forced and you have to do something about it and you can't back down and you have to boldly fight for what's right. Okay, well, I, uh, I can't disagree with you there. Uh, William, where can people go to find out more about your candidacy? Uh, it's WilliamHaston.com. Uh, all of our social media is William, F-O-R-G-A and the number four. Uh, please, please, as we round out the fundraising quarter, donate. Um, we're trying to make a big splash into 2020 and really run headlong um, at trying to win this race. Okay, William Haston, candidate for Georgia's fourth district. Thank you once again for joining us on the show. Thanks, John. On the go? Don't worry, we got you covered. You can still listen to TYT at our new podcast network. Find us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or at tyt.com slash podcast.